This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. I'm Sophie Ikenye. Our top stories. Zimbabwe's junior doctors are going back to work after a crippling strike that lasted four months. They've reached a pay deal, but not with the government. The crisis in Lesotho. Protesters call for the Prime Minister to resign as the investigation continues into the murder of the former First Lady. These gatherings are a sign of a people that want him to go sooner rather than later. But will this be enough to force him out of office? Looking for a way out uh, as spate of Al-Shabaab attacks leaves teachers in Kenya's Garissa region fearing for their lives. Also in the program, Tokumba, Gist, Mamaput. The Oxford English Dictionary adds new words to its latest edition in Nigerian English. We find out what they mean and why they made the cut. And in sports, they might be the favourites, but Ghana know it will be hard work to qualify for the 2022 World Cup in Qatar. Thanks for joining us on Focus in Africa from BBC World News. It was one of Zimbabwe's longest strikes. And now, after four months, the country's junior doctors have agreed to return to work. But the deal to end the dispute came not from the government, but the telecoms billionaire Strive Masiwa. Shinga Enyoka is in Harare. The impasse between the government and doctors had dragged on for months, and uh, it took a private citizen's initiative to end it. The doctors have agreed uh, to accept an offer from uh, the telecoms billionaire Strive Masiwa's family foundation. Um, his family has offered to pay close to 300 US dollars a month to each doctor, as well as assistance in communication costs and transport. Uh, doctors up until now had been taking home uh, less than 150 US dollars a month. I'm standing here at uh, Salim Gabe Hospital, uh, which is one of the largest uh, public hospitals, and uh, the doctors have been coming back to work and uh, some of the wards have reopened and services that had been suspended have been resumed. So we still call upon the government to look into our uh, uh, grievances because they are genuine and uh, that has, hasn't changed at all. For us to be able to operate at maximum capacity of an quality healthcare system, it needs uh, the government to seriously look into this issue and invest into our healthcare system. The allowances will only be paid for six months and it's not clear what will happen after that. But for now, one of the longest strikes in recent history, one that crippled the healthcare system and left an unknown number of people to die, has ended. Shingai Nyoka, BBC News, Harare. Well, let's bring in Zimbabwe's Finance Minister Mtuli Ngube. He joins us live from the annual World Economic Forum in Davos in Switzerland. Thanks for taking time to talk to us on the program. We'll talk about the economy in just a moment. But first, a private citizen strikes a deal with doctors in Zimbabwe. It really does not look good for the government. It's like you didn't really care. Oh, we, we, we care. I mean, the, the, the issue is that really we have uh, limited resources. Uh, but we are, we are in constant dialogue with the civil servants. We value what they do. And really, we appreciate that the doctors have gone back. Uh, I think really the gesture that we have received from the private sector uh, is really shows that government is willing to work with the private sector on a public-private partnership basis. So, so we welcome this. And government is doing its part. And we are delighted that the private sector was able to assist, uh, in this case, in the form of uh, uh, Econet uh, 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 shareholder. Uh, one of the issues that was raised by the doctor that, w that we spoke to was that there is an, uh, um, an issue of not looking quite genuine. There's no genuineness from the government. What can you tell Zimbabweans? Oh, this, the government is very genuine about uh, you know, uh, uh, interacting with the civil servants. Uh, just before I left, we approved uh, a, an allowance, again, to cushion the civil servants from the the impact of inflation to make sure that they can afford our school fees. And again, with the doctors, we're trying very hard to offer them beyond salaries. These basically are the forms of, uh, of, of uh, you know, a monument such as, you know, an ability to own their home, uh, they can access uh, various stands and so forth, as well as the ability to import uh, vehicles and other allowances. We're mm -hmm. trying everything we can, but of course we do have limited resources and we, we, we really appreciate the understanding. And, but we'll continue to dialogue and continue to do more.
Mm. Mr. Nube, there are people who are wondering what was the thinking behind uh, today's ruling that local debts incurred before 22nd February 2019 must be settled in local currency. Businesses are complaining. Banks say this is quite unfriendly. Oh, well, you know that there's a separation of powers between the judiciary, the executive, and then the uh, legislature. This is a decision of the uh, judiciary uh, as they see things. So really, uh, uh, it's, it's their decision, and we're law-abiding citizens, so we have to abide by that. Is, uh, is it a really good decision, in your opinion? Is it a good, as an economist, is it a good decision, in your opinion? No, no, no. I, I, you know what? I, I cannot comment as an economist. I'm the Minister of Finance. So I have to accept the decision of the judiciary. Uh, uh, we have a separation of powers. It is our job to abide by the law. And we're, do, we're going to do that as government. And I expect every citizen to do the same. Mm. Now, the country is, is still in dire need. In fact, the United Nations has warned that Zimbabwe faces another poor harvest this year. Are you prepared? What, what level of uh, preparations are you in? Who's helping you with this? Or as government, we are, we are more ready this year than last year, I can assure you. Uh, first of all, we've, we've put in place uh, credit lines. We're able to import uh, food, uh, maize, uh, wheat uh, from all over the world, from the region. Uh, we're working very well with, with our with domestic banking sector as well as international banks. That, that's the first thing. Uh, uh, we're also supporting agriculture and trying to climate proof uh, our agriculture, support irrigation investment. We're going to be supporting the, the winter uh, wheat uh, growing uh, program. Uh, but also on encouraging the planting of uh, drought-resistant crops, what you call traditional grains, uh, what used to be called small grains uh, in the local language. Mm. So we're doing everything to make sure that food is available. We will not allow any Zimbabwean to go hungry. On the price right. front, we're also aware that some of this food is very expensive, so we're putting in place subsidies for cornmeal, and, and, the, and this is well accepted by the citizens, and they appreciate it. I'm curious about your thoughts on the sanctions uh, from the United States and there have been calls for, for them to be lifted. What's the likely impact uh, of, if they are not lifted? What, what would happen to Zimbabwe uh, in your opinion? Well, the restrictions on certain citizens and companies in Zimbabwe is impacting the access to uh, global credit lines. And also there's a contagion effect. If a specific individual is affected, then there's a you know, question mark as to whether you know, one would want to deal with them just in case then they, they affect the next person and the next person. So the contagion effect is also part of the problem. So quite clearly, uh, our access to, uh, you know, uh, to a credit lines globally is being impacted by these restrictions. Uh, it would be great if we can make progress and these are lifted. Uh, I think Zimbabwe has made a tremendous progress since 2003 uh, in, in terms of dealing with the issues that were raised back then that became the basis for I I imposing the, the, these restrictions. And, and the progress we have made is, is on the legislative front. We had peaceful elections. We had unfortunate with some incidents. Uh, lives were lost, but the elections were peaceful. Mm. Uh, we also have made reforms on the economic front. Zimbabwe is also out of the DRC. If you recall well back, be, uh, being involved in the war in the Democratic Republic of Congo was an issue back then, but we're out of that now. So a lot right. has happened, and there's a need to update information, uh, which will show that Zimbabwe has indeed made a lot of progress. We have to leave it there. And Tuli Nube, thank you very much indeed for taking time to talk to us on Focus in Africa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, in Lesotho, there's still no sign that the crisis involving Prime Minister Thomas Tabane will be resolved anytime soon. Police are still hunting for his wife, Messiah. She's... Uh, wanted for questioning about the murder of the former First Lady. But there's growing pressure on uh, Mr. Tabani to step down immediately. And uh, the people of Lesotho have started taking to the streets in protest. Pumza Fihlani reports from the capital, Maseru. A cry for action. They call themselves Lesotho's concerned citizens. A group of ordinary people and members of different political parties. They marched in their hundreds, demanding the immediate resignation of the Prime Minister. Prime Minister Taban is not helping us. Uh, so, if it means that uh, this country will be unstable because he's insisting that he will remain in power, then let it be uh, because he's the one who's calling for it. Eight-year-old Tom Tabane and his wife, Mai Isaiah, have been linked to the gruesome murder of his previous wife. Dipulelo Tabane was gunned down outside her home in 2017 
No arrests have been made, but police say they now have a strong case. The First Lady has been on the run for about two weeks now and her husband, who is still in the country, has not addressed any of the allegations against them. We've come to the streets of Maseri to find out what people make of the controversy surrounding the first couple. No, all we need is justice. Everyone deserves a fair trial. I think if she comes back home and maybe face whatever music that is it, then everything will be okay. I think we need another Prime Minister. Because this Prime Minister don't serve us. Life may appear normal here in Lesotho, but just beneath the surface, being here you get a sense of a people that are becoming increasingly impatient with the Prime Minister and his government. This week he announced that he intends to retire, but he did not say when. People here are skeptical, they think he is stalling, and these gatherings are a sign of a people that want him to go sooner rather than later. But will this be enough to force him out of office? Humza Fihlani, BBC News, Maseru. Well, let's need to take a quick look at other stories making headlines across Africa and the rest of the world. Burkina Faso has begun two days of mourning following the latest attack by Islamist militants in the north of the country. 36 civilians were killed. Hundreds of people have fled the area and have begun arriving in the town of Kaya, north of the capital, Ouagadougou. Pre President Trump says the U.S. is adding more countries to its controversial travel ban list. Speaking at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Mr. Trump said the changes would be announced soon. Reports from the states say seven countries will be added, including Nigeria, Eritrea, Tanzania, and Sudan. Citizens from countries already on the list cannot travel to the U.S. or face severe entry restrictions. Burundi's parliament has voted to pay half a million U.S. dollars to President Pierre Nkurunziza and provide him with a luxury villa as he prepares to leave office. Mr. Nkurunziza has promised not to run for another term in elections due in May. The draft law, which has been presented to the cabinet for approval, awards him a lifetime salary. Now, dozens of teachers in Kenya's Garissa region in the northeast of the country say they fear for their lives and want to leave the area. The Islamist group Al-Shabaab has carried out six attacks in five weeks in Kenya, killing 25 people. Garissa is vulnerable. It's close to the porous border with Somalia, and the th three teachers and three students from there have died in these attacks. The BBC's Ferdinando Mondi reports from Garissa. Lucy counts herself incredibly lucky to be alive, and she is. Few have been raided by the dreaded Al-Shabaab militants and lived to tell the story. One night in January, Lucy recalls the disruptive sound of automatic rifles ripping up the silence of her school residence. She says she crawled under a bed, tightly holding her two-year-old. She survived the night with two female colleagues. Three others in a separate room were killed. Due to the trauma that we went, I would not like to be in that area anymore. I can't go in an institution where I was in the same staff with my teachers, with my fellow teachers, and they are no more. Kamuda Primary School was thought to be among the safest schools in Garissa. It is located some 200 kilometers from the Somali border. It also had a manned police post. But Al-Shabaab raided both the school and police post and set it on fire. That attack sparked fear among public servants across the region. Teachers from all over Garissa have been flocking to their regional office, some with bags already packed. We have already a shortage of teachers in this particular county. So if we move them out of the county, then we will be creating a national crisis, leave alone a county crisis. The government has sent teams made up of military and special forces to fight Al-Shabaab in the frontier areas bordering Somalia. But more than 26 people have died in the six militant attacks since December. Kenya is a country that is largely peaceful and secure. But every life that Al-Shabaab takes sows more seeds of doubt and fear about the future. Ferdinand Mondi, BBC News, Garissa. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News. Still to come, they might be the favourites, but Ghana know it will be hard work to qualify for the 2022 World Cup in Qatar. 
I'm Sophie Ikenye, and you're watching Focus on Africa, the top stories on this program. Zimbabwe's junior doctors are going back to work after a crippling strike that lasted four months. They've reached a pay deal, but not with the government. Protesters in Lesotho are calling for the Prime Minister to resign as the investigation continues into the murder of the former First Lady. You're watching BBC Focus on Africa. Let's find out what's happening in the world of sport. Victoria Wahunda. Thank you, Sophie. Now, Africa's top national teams can start finally to prepare for the 2022 World Cup qualifiers following the draw in Cairo on Tuesday. Either Cameroon or Ivory Coast will miss out on the tournament in Qatar after the two teams were drawn against each other in the second round of African qualifying campaign. But the indomitable lions or the elephants aren't the only ones who've got work to do. Ghanaian journalist Michael Otiaje looks at the chances and possible upsets. I think many of the top sides in African football will be reasonably happy with the, with the draw for the qualifiers for the 2022 FIFA World Cup points. Uh, of course, there's almost a group of death in one of these, and I think Group D easily stands out. Cameroon, six-time World Cup participant, the most by an African country, are up against Ivory Coast, who have made it a regular habit of showing up at a tournament uh, since they first appeared in 2006 as the uh, undisputed heavyweight clash of the African qualifiers. Ghana versus South Africa uh, in Group G looks also complicated, but that group is even more complicated by the fact that Zimbabwe can turn up anytime they want, or that Ethiopia tends to be tricky, especially when they are playing at home. Egypt have a group they will be happy with, but they have to contend with North African rivals, Libya. That always tends to test countries a lot more. And then there's Gabon, who with Pierre America and uh, would always feel they have a chance. Generally, a fairly balanced draw, one that a lot of the top sides in African football will be reasonably happy with. Ghana's coach CK Akono was there as the Black Stars drew South Africa, Zimbabwe and Ethiopia in Group G, one of the toughest of the 10 groups. He has promised that Ghana will put in the work to qualify. We will put in the hard work to qualify. You know, Ghana is a, a great football nation and it is our dream uh, to get to the World Cup. Saying this, we, we know all the teams, South Africa, Zimbabwe and others, will do their bit to get there, but we will put in hard work and we know that hard work pays. Away from the football now, Africa's top women's tennis player, Ons Jabeur of Tunisia, marches on at the Australian Open in Melbourne. After her stunning opening round victory over the 12th seed Johanna Conta, Jabeur followed it up with a victory over Caroline Garcia of France. The Tunisian came back from a set down to book her place in the third round. And Zimbabwe's cricketers closed the fourth day of the opening test against Sri Lanka in Harare on 30-0 in their second innings. They still trail Sri Lanka's huge first inning score of 5.15 for nine declared by 127 runs. Sophie, not this spot be that. <laughs> Victoria, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Now, you might take a done for to work and call the months running up to Christmas, the Ember months. These are just some of the e Nigerian English words now included in the Oxford English Dictionary. So let's discuss this. I'm joined in studio by BBC Africa's Bolahan Makjob and from Oxford by Danica Salazar, the world English editor at the Oxford English Dictionary. Thanks uh, both of you for taking time to talk to us. I'll come to you, Danica, in just a moment. But tell us about these words. I know you can't go through all of them, but what do they mean? Well, first of all, Sophie, let me say how far. How far? Yeah, that's how you say hello in pigeon. And now but how then I, say... I can also say how you day, how body, mm -hmm. how on a day. You know, so with pigeon, I mean, it's not it, you know one thing can mean several other things. So which which words stand out for you in this particular list that's been uh, added, added into the uh, dictionary? I think for me, the one that that quite intrigued me is the ones that I didn't realize were a problem prior to now. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes in Nigeria, people will say stuff like severally you know, in, in terms of wanting to say several times. Mm -hmm. So we would say severally, or you could say, well, I want this interview to be qualitative, meaning I want it to be of quality. And for a long time, people didn't realize that wasn't uh, grammatically correct at the time. But right now, it is grammatically correct. I can say severally without worrying about it. I can say I want a qualitative interview. I want a qualitative cleaning. I want a qualitative ironing without bothering about it. Let me bring you in here, Danica. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering how you determine what uh, words should be included in the dictionary? 
Well, in the OED, we have what we call language corpora. So they're a digitized collection of different texts. And we do frequency studies on these corpora, uh, which tell us which words are increasingly being used in different parts of the world so that we can investigate them further and, and consider them for inclusion. But for Nigerian English especially, since it's a regional variety, we also had to rely on local expertise. So for we had um, an excellent uh, Nigerian language consultant called Kingsley Ugwani, who gave us really valuable advice on usage and, and also on Nigerian culture. All right. Let's talk about some of the words that you have on you. I think you have a few words on your paper. Ma, ma, I, I talked about uh, Mama Ember Mans. What is that? Put. Yes. <laughs> so Mama Put, uh, you know, with, uh, that, that means restaurant. Yeah. Because usually most restaurants are run by women. Mm -hmm. And if you want to buy food, you know, you go there with your plate and you say, uh, put meat, put plantain, put rice, Mama, put this one, Mama, put more. <laughs> And then it's like, what's the point? Just go Mama Put. And hence it became the name for restaurant. Are there, are there, uh, is there, I'm, I'm wondering why this, this is very, um, it can be very popular because not all the words are pidgin. And in fact, Danica, maybe you can answer that for us. Not all the words uh, that have been included are pidgin, uh, are they? Yes, so there's the use of uh, the phrase eat money to mean to embezzle or take money in an illegal, illegal manner. So that's originally uh, used in, in Nigerian pidgin context. And also the use of chop and chop chop to mean also embezzlement. And also the, the expression sef, which uh, probably could have come from the word um, originally from English safe and then was later used in Nigerian Pigeon English and then it came back to English via Nigerian English. So that's mm. a particularly interesting word as well. Mm. And what, what did yeah. you find that the, including these words important? Well, because we believe in, the, because the OED f more than anything is an historical dictionary. So its role is to tell the whole story of the development of the English language. And we feel that especially in today's globalized wor world, people like the, like Nigerians who speak English as a second language have a very important role to play in this history. So if you're really going to tell the story right, Nigerians have to be a part of it. What about Pidgin? Because it's widely spoke, uh, spoken in general. In Nigeria alone, 75 million, and the region yeah. too. Um, yeah. isn't, w wasn't Pidgin enough? Well, uh, well, first, well, the, the Oxford English Dictionary is an English dictionary, so all the words that are in it are English words. But uh -huh. we consider Nigerian Pidgin English to be a different language altogether that could just like French or Latin or Greek, which are sources of, of borrowings for English and are languages that enrich in, uh, in English vocabulary of, as a whole, Nigerian Pidgin English is, can also be a source of borrowings for, for, for English. And, mm. and that's a great thing. And, that, and we have evidence to show that Nigerians do use these originally Pidgin words when they speak in English. All right. Uh I mean, I have to ask you which words you think should be included in the dictionary. <laughs> well, it's, it's interesting because I feel like uh, words like I beg should be included. Mm -hmm. I beg could mean please or I beg of you. You know, you, could, you, you hear the beg, I beg. Or it could be I beg, like don't. Mm -hmm. You know, so sometimes it's about the context of how you use it. Mm -hmm. And also words like gra gra. What's, what's gra gra? Gra gra is when you're being a bit extra, when you're being like... Uh, Problematic or aggressive, aggressive, like don't do gra gra, or this person's gra gra is too much. So you don't be, don't do gra gra here yes. in the studio. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you both, uh, Danica. Thank you very much for taking time to talk to us, and of course, uh, Mac Job. Thank you. Thank you. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Well, um, that's it on Focus on Africa for now. Thank you for your company. Bye bye.